beautiful Savior, our Redeemer, Lutheran Church. We're glad you joined us today. We begin with the hymn, Earth and All Stars. We rise. Jesus. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray that you so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that ever mindful of your final judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness of living here and dwell with you in perfect joy hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> The Old Testament reading from Isaiah 44, 6 to 8. Is there a God besides me? This is what the Lord said. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes. Let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This is for the whole congregation. Lord, you are I promise to obey your word. children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. We rise.
back at the parish I served in Corpus Christi, Trinity, one of our music ministers had a little daughter about the age of eight or nine who was, shall I say, a little rambunctious. She had more energy than two kids put together. At times, I felt sorry for her mother, that her mother had to deal with all of that nonstop action. At times, you just want to say, can you stop? She was going, going, going all the time, full of energy. She was not a bad child, only full of energy. And the questions that she would ask. One Sunday on the way to church, she asked her mother where God came from. If God created the earth and me and Adam and Eve, well, who created God? I loved the mother's answer. She said, when we get to church, you can ask the pastor and kept driving. <laughs> so after the late service, I have a visit to my office from this little girl and her mother, and we uh, get engaged in a theological conversation, me and this nine-year-old girl or so, and I don't think my answer satisfied her. I told her that nobody created God, that God has always existed, and he will always exist forever. But who made God? Nobody made God, I affirmed. He is, was, and ever shall be. In the beginning, God. God was already there at the beginning, but she wasn't satisfied. But before that, before the beginning, who made him? Somebody had to do it. This conversation seemed futile. There was just no convincing her. But where did God come from? I finally said, probably from China, everything else does. And as she got up, she turned and said, yeah, my mom said you probably wouldn't know the answer either. And she ran off hopping and skipping and bouncing off the walls. Several years ago, a second grade Sunday school teacher in Georgia asked her young children in the class to take out a, an index card and write out a question for God that you'd want to ask him if you were able to, and then not to write their name on the index card, but to turn them in anonymously. They would later in the day read aloud the questions in the class and try to resolve the questions, if any may, may had the answer. Go ahead, she says now, take out your index card and go ahead, ask God any question you want. And you can imagine what some of the questions were. For instance, dear God, is it true that my father won't go to heaven if he uses his bowling words in the house? <laughs> Dear God, did you mean for the giraffe to look like that, or was that an accident? Dear God, I read the Bible. What does beget mean? Nobody will tell me. <laughs> Dear God, I went to a wedding, and they kissed there right in church. Is that okay? Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but I asked for a puppy. Questions. They're easy to ask, but sometimes hard to answer. And once in a while, the only one able to answer our question is God. And that's what today's message is all about. Because the message in today's gospel, the parable Jesus tells about the wheat and the weeds, speaks to one of the most prevalent of all of our sins, the sin of judging other people. Now, I know nobody here would ever do that. But just in case someone out there in TV land engages in the prevalent sin of judging other people, we should all take a look in the mirror and see if that person be us. We look around and we think that we have the ability to separate the weeds from the wheat. Jesus recognized this tendency in his followers and said, frankly, judge not lest you be judged. For with the same judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you receive, particularly when it comes to church. There's something deep down inside of us that wants us to separate the sheep from the goats, us from them over there, the saints from the sinners, the good guys from the bad guys. We all have our own little litmus test, but they're pretty much the same, based mostly on how others act, how they dress, how they talk, where they live, what they do for a living. The common denominator among us that brings us together is what attracts our group together, what we have in common. 
The gospel lesson today is really about who is being saved and from what. Jesus was standing there before the crowds of people trying to explain what the kingdom of God is like, and he had told them, as he often did, some parables in describing the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like a man who had two sons, or the kingdom of God is like the farmer who had a hundred lost sheep and one of them went missing. Or the kingdom of God is like a great big fishing net thrown out into the sea. Understand the parable Jesus said, and you will understand what heaven is like. In today's lesson, Jesus is prompted to tell a parable about judgment. Perhaps some people were being harshly critical of those who were not religious enough, or righteous enough, or perfect enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. Something prompted Jesus to say to the crowd, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who planted wheat, but an enemy came around later when no one was around and sowed weeds among the wheat. The servants offered to go out to the field and pull up the weeds, but the farmer said no. I always have a problem with that part of the sermon where the the servants offered to go out to the field and pull up the weeds. I don't know how many summers the kids have said, is there any work that I can do to earn some money? I said, yes, can you pull? No, anything but that. That's like the last thing in the world they want to do is pull wheat. I mean, pull weeds. And here are these guys volunteer. Where are these guys when you need them? But Jesus said, don't do that. I'll tell you what we'll do. When harvest time, when the plants are mature, when it's easy to tell the wheat from the weeds, then they will be separated. But right now, they look too much alike. Right now here on this church, or here in this church, on this church on earth, right now the whole Christian church on earth, the weeds look just like the wheat. There are some non-Christians who act more like Christians than some Christians. And there are Christians who act like they're not Christian. The world is too churchy and the church is too worldly. The weeds and the wheat look very similar right now. And we don't have the capacity within us to judge the wheat from the weeds. In Jesus' day, sowing weeds in a neighbor's field was a common way folks had of troubling their neighbors. Instead of spray painting graffiti on their rock wall of the house or egging the neighbor's chariot, they'd sow Johnson grass, which when young looks just like edible wheat in the neighbor's wheat or barley. It had become such a common practice that the Roman government actually passed a law against sowing weeds in somebody's field. Now, it is believed today that these weeds that Jesus was referring to in the wheat field are an an annual grass that looks very much like wheat, and it's called Darnell grass. You can look it up on the internet, and they'll show you a picture. It looks very much like wheat when it's young. Darnell grass usually grows in the same production zones that wheat grows in and was a a serious weed of cultivation until modern sorting machinery enabled Darnell seeds to be separated efficiently from seeds of wheat. But the similarity between these two plants is so great that in some regions, Darnell grass is referred to as false wheat. It's like fool's gold. It looks like gold, but it's not. It bears a close resemblance to wheat until the ear appears. So distinguishing genuine wheat and this false wheat in the early stages of growth is nearly impossible. But to these servants, you want us to go out there and pull those weeds? No, it's impossible right now. But separating the two does eventually become necessary. Because unless the weeds are removed, then flour made from the wheat will be ruined by the weeds, which is both bitter and mildly toxic. The usual solution is to harvest the plants, spread them out on a flat surface, and then remove the weeds, which by this stage are a different color than the wheat. So in that simple story today, in the parable of the weeds and the wheat, Jesus told the disciples two things. First, that in the kingdom of heaven, God is fair and just, and judgment will come about in the end. You just sit on your pretty little tuff, and it'll come about, but let God do it in his time. A day never passes when we do not make a negative comment about something someone else has done. We criticize people for the way they dress, for the way they talk, or for the way they do things. We all do it. And I know somebody's doing it about me today, too. 
So we talk about them and they talk about us and it's just an irritating part of being human. Sometimes, even as Christians, we want to decide who are the weeds and who is the wheat of this world. We offer, like this man's servants, to go out and pull up the weeds. We can't let them stay here in the church, so perhaps it's time to weed the garden. Pull out those undesirable weeds. Pull out the not friendly enough weeds. Pull out the low income weeds. Pull out the overweight weeds and the unlutheran weeds. If we could just figure out who the weeds are and remove them, then we'd have a perfect church. Several years ago, I heard a man on TV say, I only know two things in life for certain. First, there is a God. And second, I'm not him. That is why it is so unfair for us, and I'm speaking to myself as well as everybody here, to make judgments about people's lives. We're not God. We don't know the baggage they carry. We don't know the scars on their hearts. All we know is what we see on the outside. And according to the gardener, the master in this parable, that's not enough information to start pulling weeds. Could it be that way, even in the weeds around us, even in the weediest people that we know, when it comes to human nature, none of us is ever completely a saint or a sinner? We're kind of a combination of both. We have our good days and our bad days. St. Augustine, in the 5th century, in commenting on this parable, says, there is this difference between people and real grain and real weeds. For what was grain in the field is grain, and what were weeds are weeds. But in the Lord's field, which is the church, at times what was grain turned into weeds, and at times what was weeds turns into grain. And no one knows what that will be tomorrow. You may be a weed today, but by the constant direction of the Holy Spirit upon our lives, we may become wheat. So remember the t-shirt or the bumper sticker. Remember the one, please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. I'm just an old chunk of coal, but I'm going to be a diamond someday. You know that's true because you know, like I know, that even in our own lives, yes, there are more weeds in our lives than we care to admit. There's that secret weed that nobody else knows about and that we're ashamed of and embarrassed. Oh, we keep those weeds well hidden so that no one will see us and judge us. But we know they're there, and so does God. And so our entire life is a process of weeding where God takes this weed out of our life but allows that thorn over there to continue growing until the harvest to make us stronger to make us into the person he wants us to be. Remember Paul said, I prayed three times that God would remove this thorn in my side. And the Lord told him each time, no, my grace is sufficient for you. God used that thorn, whatever it may have been. Some people say it was an eyesight problem. Some people say it was this, it was this other thing. Whatever it was, we don't know. And that's a good thing that we don't know because now we can say maybe it was my problem. And God refuses to take away that thorn because his grace is sufficient. And that thorn is going to make us stronger and more shiny in the kingdom of the righteous when we're done. Sometimes we look back at our lives and wonder, how in the world did I ever make it this far? You ever done that before? I was so dumb back then. Yet none of you ever thought that way? We wonder how we made it this far. How could I have been so dumb but aren't you glad that God didn't go to Whedon back then and pluck us out back then, but rather he gives us time and nurture and surrounds us with people of grace all of our life. And that's the point of this parable, that neither should we give up on one another. Loving the sinner and hating the sin means being tolerant of those who are different from us. Loving the sinner and hating the sin means calling people into accountability for their actions, but always being willing to forgive. It occurs to me that the kingdom of God here on earth is actually comprised of people who have known the enormous grace of God from experience. That's why we're here. It's people like us who are deeply aware of our sin, but also aware of the God who has chosen to forgive those sins and who hasn't given up on us. 
We ought to be people of grace and willing also to forgive one another. Isn't that what the gospel message is through and through? I know it's not always easy to forgive, and I know it's not always simple, and there's lots of issues, and not always black and white, and there's people that say, well, I'll, I'll forgive them as soon as they ask for forgiveness, and other people that say they shouldn't have to ask you. The people never ask Jesus to forgive them, but he says, Father, forgive them. So there's all kind of, it's a not an easy issue. It's not always simple, but I also know that that is exactly what Jesus has called us to do, to be gracious forgivers, because he has been gracious to us. Amen. We are not going to pass the offering plate today because of the uh, restrictions on uh, contact and six foot distance and so forth. But we are going to stand and sing the offertory because it's a good old hymn of the church. My faith looks up to thee. My faith looks up to thee, thou for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you have been the refuge and strength of your people from generation to generation. Give to us the comfort of your presence in this time of trouble. Give us your grace to forgive our sins and give us the grace to forgive those that sin against us. Give us your peace to govern our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, Lord, we know that your power holds all things together in heaven and on earth. Give wisdom to those who lead our nations and guidance to those who make, administer, and judge our laws so that life may be protected and justice may be administered. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your holy word speaks hope and life. Open our ears to hear your voice. Give us ears to hear like in the parable said today, he who has ears. So give us those ears, Lord. Open our ears to hear your voice and our hearts to believe in Jesus Christ and to follow him as Savior and Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your church lives by the grace you bestow through word and sacrament. Bless the pastors who preach to us this gospel and the church workers who serve us in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your mercy extends to all of our needs and your grace gives healing according to your will. Hear us on behalf of all who are suffering today in mind and body. We lift up to you those who are suffering uh, through COVID-19 and who's not only for those who are actually suffering, but their family members who are very worried and concerned about them. We also lift up to you today Vera Lott, Bill Schmidt, Helen Barnett, Linda Settlemeyer, Diane Bochi, Kim Priest, Shirley Wendler, Gary Schmidt. Louise O'Grodowitz, Pastor Kelm, Bernice Bates, Karen Wolf, Linda Wallington, and of course, Lord, all who stand in need of your aid. Grant to them grace sufficient for all their needs and sustain them in the hour of trial. We also pray, Lord, that you'd give more and more blessings to Emily Blaze, uh, who's celebrating her birthday this week. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have granted us a place at the table of your Son. Help us to receive his body and blood with repentance and faith, and to keep in holy lives the precious gift we will receive upon our lips. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is already in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. unto the Lord our God. It is our duty and our delight to give you praise and thanks at all times and in all places. For you have shown your mercy through the ages and delivered us up by the saving death and life-giving resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the image of your glory and the Savior of all who trust in you. So together with angels and archangels and with all those who died in Christ and rest now from their labors, we join their eternal song of praise and thanksgiving, rejoicing before you to say, Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, when supper was ended, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant, in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it to remember me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. rise for the note to us.
almighty and everlasting God, you have delivered us from the darkness of sin and granted us life in your Son. Grant to us also your Holy Spirit, that we walk in the light of your Son all of our days, and bring us at last to that day when we shall shine like the sun in your presence forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, God. God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.